Welcome to the Washington Legal Foundation's web seminar series. My name is Glenn Lamby. I'm Chief Counsel of the Foundation's Legal Studies Division. And we are coming to you today from our headquarters in DuPont Circle in Washington. For those of you who are not familiar with the Foundation, we are in our 41st year of public interest law and policy advocacy through litigation in all uh, federal and state courts, uh, filing original and amicus actions. Publications is our second prong. We uh, publish on a wide range of issues. Anybody who has an interest in our publications, you can check those out on our website and uh, subscribe to receive publications in your areas of interest as well. And uh, our third part is our communicating aspect. We put on programs such as these, media briefings, a blog called the WLF Legal Pulse that we do uh, our own writing on as well as writing by outside attorneys and, and others. And uh, we also are, af are active uh, in writing op-eds as well. Back in 2004, a WLF legal backgrounder described three of the so-called virtues of the liability theory our speakers will address today. One, public nuisance standards are exceedingly vague and therefore pliable. Two, public nuisance focuses on present harm, not past conduct. Three, all costs from the purported harm can be aggregated with no need to prove that any one person was harmed. For those and other reasons, public nuisance has become the go-to regulation by litigation weapon for states and even municipalities with the active encouragement and assistance of private plaintiff's lawyers. In the past year, I've seen a stunning growth of, of public nuisance-based lawsuits. In just the past two weeks, the California Supreme Court denied review in a nuisance suit brought by 10 cities and counties alleging harm for lead paint. And just yesterday, the U.S. Department of Justice announced its support for local and state lawsuits alleging that the sale and distribution of painkillers, uh, opioid painkillers, constitute a public nuisance. Uh, we'll be talking about those and other issues as well today. Our speakers are going to be using uh, PowerPoint slides, which you will see on the screen as you watch this. If you're interested in downloading those slides, they are available in a link underneath the view screen on, on our homepage there. You can also ask questions. There is a Q&A panel next to the video screen when it's in its minimized size. Those questions will come to me directly, and I will ask those questions of the speakers when we get to the Q&A part of our, of our presentation. I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which they will do their presentations, and then I will step aside. Their bios are there on the screen. I'll just briefly introduce them. Richard Falk, who's going to lead off, is counsel with Davis Wright Tremaine in the firm's Washington, D.C. office. He's written extensively on public nuisance litigation, including co-authoring a 2014 paper for WLF that won a Burton Award for Distinguished Legal Writing. Following him will be Nero Markle, who's a partner with Kelly Dry and Warren in the firm's New York City office. He's a commercial lawyer, litigator, and trial attorney with more than 30 years of experience in contract, commercial law, and civil litigation. He serves on the Commercial Division Advisory Council, which is charged with advising on matters concerning the Commercial Division of the Supreme Court of the State of New York. Rick, if you could get us started. Okay. Thank you, Glenn, and I'm very pleased to be here today. It's always an honor to work with the WLF. Uh, I've done so many things with you guys for so long and the causes that you pursue uh, are almost mirroring the things that I am concerned about and by derivation I believe my clients are concerned about. Public nuisance is probably the most problematic but persistent cause of action in America. Uh, it has been around for a very long time and it has gotten terrible reputation throughout all of its years of existence, particularly by people who find that they're attacked by it. But nonetheless, even those who favor it have difficulty understanding it. It's been described as notoriously contingent and unsummarizable. Uh, generations of legal scholars have express their frustration with it in the most unhappy terms. Dean Prosser has said it's a legal garbage can full of vagueness, uncertainty, and confusion. Horace Wood described it as a wilderness at law. Richard Epstein has says that nuisance law doesn't work on a moral or deductive principle. Justice Blackman has said more, one searches in vain for anything resembling a principle in the common law of nuisance. Well, and now that's a, not a very happy introduction for this old traditional cause of action. 
But what is public nuisance really? And what is the big deal of it? How can we simplify it in a way that we understand how it might and originally was intended to be used? This picture is uh, not exactly a, uh, a picture that anyone would quite understand until I tell you that it's a picture of a street uh, in Houston, Texas after Hurricane Harvey. And what happened was, uh, let's assume that I owned the lot upon which this tree sat before it fell across a public road. Well, when it fell across a public road, it interfered with the public transit and thereby became a public nuisance for which if I didn't remove it or I didn't enlist the help of someone else who did, uh, it would remain a public nuisance and I would be actionable. If, however, it had happened to fall over on my neighbor's house, it would not be a public nuisance. It could be, have been a private nuisance because it was only something that worked against two parties. The key here is that there's a public right in the middle of this tort. And without that public right, it is not a public nuisance. It is something else, but it is not that. So what exactly is a public nuisance? Well, it's been defined a thousand different ways by all those who are very anxious to understand what it means, but it's generally something that obstructs or causes inconvenience to common rights, to rights that we all hold, uh, and things that interfere with rights common to the general public. It has to be a public right, not a private one. And the test is not the number of persons annoyed, but by the way the annoyance is inflicted on the public by its invasion of rights. So here we are. We now see that public nuisance is being used, as we'll hear later about the opioid context and other things I'm going to talk about, it's, been it's now being used to demonize products uh, in lieu of product liability litigation. But it's intuitively, it really doesn't make a great deal of sense to use it that way because since when are products used in a public manner, typically things like leaded paints or opioid products are used by individual citizens. And those products are used not by the public, by individual people. The number of persons isn't the test. The test is the nature of the right, whether it's individual or general public. The harm has to be substantial. It has to be something that materially interferes and something that is commonly recognized through plain and sober and simple notions. It has to be an unreasonable interference. It can't be a trivial interference. It has to have some impact on the public health and safety, peace, comfort, or convenience of the public. And it, it could be prescribed by statute. It could be of a continuing, long-lasting nature, and the defendant knows that it has some impact on that person as a matter of ongoing harm. Well, I've been sitting here giving you all these definitions, but what exactly is a public nuisance? Well, the answer is nothing is exactly a public nuisance. The tort is, in fact, one of the most subjective causes of action known to common law. It is, for those who are interested in stretching liability, it is extraordinarily elastic. For example, is the opioid epidemic a public nuisance? Did the pharmaceutical industries create it? Is childhood lead poisoning a public nuisance? Are lead paint manufacturers responsible? How about noise and light camp contamination produced by permitted hydraulic fracturing and by drilling operations? Is that a public nuisance? Are the drilling operations responsible of the operators? Is PCB contamination of the West Coast rivers, bays, and estuaries a public nuisance? Is the PCB manufacturer responsible for making the product? 
Is that enough to make them liable in public nuisance? How about the alleged rising sea levels threatening coastal cities as a result of climate change? Again, is that a public nuisance caused by the fossil fuel companies? Is, is it their exacerbation of global warming that has caused this situation to occur? Well, let's go back to the beginning. Common, this all originated at common law. Public nuisance came from England, as do many other things come from England in our history. Generally, it's used to redress situations that impose a right on the public at large. I can't drill that home more loudly than I'm doing it. Not private persons, such as blocking roads and sidewalks, unsanitary conditions, and of course, immoral activities, where houses have activities that the public uh, does not share. American courts adopted Kinglish common law and therefore recognized the cause of action of public nuisance. The Industrial Revolution prompted courts to apply the doctrine to an increasing variety of situations in a more complex society. Environmental claims were in fact recognized for spills and dumping into discrete streams for polluting water supplies. And in each instance, the court focused on whether what was being done focused on an interference with a public right, not upon the rights of individuals, not upon its impact on their private property or on their private residences. As the society came out of the Great Depression, we then had something else come in that took over from the courts in regulating the way our society would behave. And those were called regulations, administrative law through the Administrative Procedure Act, all those regulations proliferated and enforcement resulted in the decline of public nuisance litigation to the point was uh, until at such time at that point it wasn't even mentioned in the first restatement of torts. So as things percolated along Dean Prosser decided that in fact public nuisance it's really not something that's suitable for modern jurisprudence in terms of products, and it should really be restricted to criminal conduct. As he tried to pursue strict products liability and succeeded in using that as a basis for defective products. And despite all the opposition for environmentalists who wanted a broader application of public nuisance claims when the restatement second was proposed, Prosser's narrower interpretation prevailed. As approved, the restatement recognized that unreasonable interference with a public right could support a public nuisance case, but it precluded claims based on conduct that fell outside of the common law claim of public nuisance, or conduct not prohibited by a legislative act. And even at this point, the preponderance and the need for uh, the legislature to weigh in and give standards and specificity to public nuisance was recognized. Prophetically, the restatement's drafters warned courts, specifically in the comments, that if they based public nuisance on other grounds, the courts risked acting without established and recognized standards. And this problem, this issue of standardless liability, has been the absolute most difficult problem of modern public nuisance litigation. Because courts have traditionally resisted invitations to expand public nuisance in the absence of clear boundaries and guiding standards respect for the legislative and executive spheres and the constitutional limits on judicial power was critical because otherwise the courts would be deciding political questions. And those aren't justiciable because they can't be based on principled, rational, and reasonable distinctions. Without standards, there can be no effective judicial process. 
as we see in the in the California courts, situations where, um, in fact, public nuisance is now proliferating. Uh, the People versus Lim case, about all the way back in 1941, the Supreme Court of California said, in the field of terms so vague and uncertain, it's a proper function of the legislature to define breaches of public policy, which are to be considered public nuisances. Am I in the right spot here? No. Uh, let me catch up. Um, should I be on the, sta the standard list liability slide? Back to. Back to. Okay. And finally, in 1997, in People v. Rayo v. Alcuna, the Supreme Court of California, in dealing with whether gang violence was a public nuisance, the court said, and I quote, this law-making supremacy serves as a break on any tendency in the courts to enjoin conduct and punish it with the contempt power under a standardless notion of what constitutes a public nuisance. We have come a long way from People versus Alcuna, which was not even discussed and cited in the by the Supreme Court of California when it decided not to review uh, the recent case regarding lead-based paints. Public nuisance under the restatement of torts, we don't have to look very closely at this, but everyone knows that public nuisance is a collective right. It is not a right to be free from personal intrusion and courts are really reluctant to recognize a public right so broad and undefined that the presence of any dangerous instrumentality in the community can be deemed to threaten it. Defendants have to control the situation that causes the public nuisance. It can't be something that just arises unexpectedly from a storm, for example, or from flooding, for example. They have to be in control of the consequences, and if they are not, there is no basis for their liability. Moreover, public nuisance is an equitable cause of action, and it is governed by equitable remedies, not by money damages, unless it can be abated or cured or corrected by uh, injunctive relief or court orders. There is no basis for it. Money damages are inappropriate. In, and traditionally and have always been inappropriate in these situations. Abatement has been the remedy, yet the awards given these days are now almost always based in money damages. Well, the problem that was happening, of course, with Professor Prosser's product liability situations was that it had its limits. There were some things that simply could not be dealt with by product liability cases, although uh, product liability was originally viewed as progressive, uh, it developed into something different it, because product liability wasn't something that provided absolute liabilities. You had to have product identification, causation, there were statutes of limitations and state-of-the-art defenses, product liability statutes, for example, statutes of repose, made recovery more difficult. Even CERCLA contained a product liability exception that protected manufacturers from liability. Plaintiff's counsel began faced with these situations looking for a more elastic option to sue people over in these sorts of situations. And there is nothing, as we've seen, that is more elastic than um, <laughs> public nuisance. And so what happened? There was a transmutation from people who were dealing with lead, they sought to find gold. And they started to change the way that, pub, that pub, this sort of contact and this sort of situation and this sort of statute and this sort of cause of action was dealt with. 
The, to expand the liability, plaintiff's lawyers needed something new, and public nuisance was chosen because it didn't focus on the existence of a defect. It was merely the right thing in the wrong place, as Justice Blackman said in a famous Supreme Court opinion, like a pig in a parlor instead of the barnyard. Similarities ended there, however, because to obtain recovery, plaintiffs needed a more absolute theory. They wanted something that didn't require control by the defendant. They wanted something that didn't have to have a particular defendant's product identified. They didn't want to talk about a particular inj injury. They didn't want to deal with the question of third-party contributions or the need for competing or the effects of competing state statutes or executive re regulations. Suits based on these principles, calling themselves public nuisance lawsuits, were first filed in New Jersey, Rhode Island, Ohio, and California. A favorable verdict in New Rhode Island re was reversed, but a California appellate court just recently affirmed. The Rhode Island model basically was as broad and as amorphous as one can imagine. The public nuisance existed when the cumulative presence of lead paint, the product involved in that case, created a burden that the public should not bear. The number of homes was never identified or quantified. The fact that it was in private homes as to public places was irrelevant. What public right was involved when only private homes were affected? and control by the defendants over the conditions at the time of injury was not required. How could they have prevented the injury? How will they abate it if they have no control over the area to be abated? The court has no jurisdiction under those sorts of circumstances. This claim is not really a tort. It is an assessment based on status. It is really a tax imposed by a common law court on the basis of a defendant's status as opposed to blameworthiness. So how much is now owed as a result of this? Well, it was beaten in Rhode Island, it was beaten in various other places, but in California, a judgment was in fact returned. And the Court of Appeals affirmed the liability there was a $1.1 billion judgment to begin with. It was then reduced to $400 million. And just this month, the California Supreme Court looked at that and decided, we're not going to review that. And without a single critical judgment or I, the California Supreme Court allowed this particular situation to stand. And as we all know from McCulloch versus Maryland, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And that's from our Chief Justice Marshall so, so long ago. What is happening here is we are giving our courts the authoritative power separately from any other regulatory, administrative, or legislative control to do exactly what they want to do with our society. And if that doesn't unbalance the balance of powers, I don't know what does. Texas, though, has a bit of a compromise precision. Yes, they generally go along with the standards of public nuisance at common law, but they also recognize that Justice Blackmun's idea about something being abnormal and out of place with its surroundings, they say, well, that's not really a public nuisance. So we all know that in Texas, although they generally follow the common law of public nuisance, a pig in a parlor is not necessarily a nuisance. Instead, there has to be other more clear standards applied. I'd like to now move to the, the biggest problem that we're all facing in public nuisance these days, and that is climate change. 
There have been a number of lawsuits that have been filed against the automotive industry, energy company, oil and gas producers, refiners, and governmental agencies, despite all kinds of problems of causation and collective responsibility. Federal suits have typically been dismissed. The first wave of this litigation was dismissed because they were political questions, because the Obama administration's greenhouse gas regulations and the amendments to the Clean Air Act displaced these sorts of claims and causes of actions. Even the most sympathetic case involving the Inuit tribe in Alaska in San Francisco federal court was their claim was reversed by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But as the polar bears threatened status came and as more endangered species were um, endangered, there was a greater concern about common, uh, about global warming. Uh, and these claims began strengthened, so there was a second wave of this type of litigation. There is a new West Coast climate change litigation where California cities and counties have sued 37 oil, gas, and coal companies claiming billions of climate change related damages by residents, businesses, and the environment, in respect to the environment. Claims based on public nuisance seek damages to homes, businesses, roads, beaches, wetlands, and habitats from rising seas and more severe storms. Energy companies allegedly went to great lengths to learn about these hazards, but still kept them secret. The most difficult problem that we face, though, is this. The cities and their claims contrasted significantly to the statements they made to their bondholders in their municipal bond offerings. Classic example from Oakland. Oakland alleged in its offering, the city is unable to predict when natural events such as sea rise or other impacts of climate change or flooding from a major storm could occur and when they may occur and if such events occur, whether they will have a materially adverse effect. Now how in the world can that difference be explained from their pleadings? Unlike mere allegations and pleadings, there are serious consequences for making wrongful statements or inaccurate statements in securities offering. These are actionable under a strict liability standard. Did the city's litigation and securities lawyers discuss this before each of them went their own way? It seems that they may not have done so as thoroughly as they had hoped. Because of all this great disparity between the allegations and the disclaimers, ExxonMobil has filed a petition for discovery in Texas state court seeking early discovery of the underlying basis for the lawsuits. And if that's not a clash of the titans, I don't know what is. This, lastly, there is another set of major PCB litigation pending in the West Coast. Monsanto Corporation has been sued by cities and counties for manufacturing PCBs that contaminated stormwater and ultimately contaminated bays, estuaries, and rivers. The interesting thing about all that is, though, that Monsanto did not put the PCBs in the water. It was the responsibility of the cities to protect their water by making sure that their stormwater was properly filtered and examined and that they made sure that no contaminants of any substantial amount got into the city's water supplies. Nonetheless, despite the fact that it was the city, the city had to pay for that and clean it up themselves. And since they don't want to pay for that on their own, they are naturally suing Monsanto to get the difference. There have been no motions to dismiss so far granted, finally, and rights by, sought by Monsanto to get contribution or cost sharing have uh, so far not been granted. Uh, these are all cases uh, by strong lawyers on both sides, and the fight will continue 
indefinitely, I suppose, until such time as some victor emerges, assuming that you can find a victor in such a difficult sort of situation. Well, that's the lay of the land, so to speak, the history and the lay of the land. The situation is, in my opinion, standardless still. And when it's standardless still, the damage continues not only to the people involved, the companies involved, but to our system of justice. For without standards, there can be no justice. Thank you. Good afternoon. Over 200 cases have been filed in the past couple of years uh, arising out of what has been called the opioid epidemic or the opioid crisis. Nuisance claims have been asserted in many, if not most of them. They're in states as diverse as Alabama, Mississippi, New York, West Virginia, Minnesota, Texas, Florida, state and federal courts. There are well-known plaintiffs firms who are representing many counties and in fact are out uh, meeting with counties even as we speak to uh, uh, bring some more cases. Uh, this is probably just the beginning of, of the flood. Who is being sued? Uh, right now there's a core of about 20 manufacturers and three national distributors are the focus of most of these cases, but there are other parties as well and we can expect the list of defendants to grow as things progress. What's the gist of the claim? It's simply stated it's Opioids are pain medication. Supposedly, the manufacturers understated the, uh, overstated the benefits and understated the risk of uh, addiction and harm. And the distributors are charged with failing to monitor sales and allowing sufficient quantities of these opioids to be diverted into criminal markets where people have been injured. Uh, I have up on the uh, slide there some recent headlines in this that shows you where this is going. You have. Opioid abuse is everywhere. Uh, even the puppy wasn't safe from uh, America's opioid crisis. Uh, born addicted, the number of opioid addicted babies is soaring. So when you have puppies and babies, can of course the politicians be far behind and then we have uh, Governor Christie on opioids. Uh, it's worse than the AIDS case. It's worse than the AIDS epidemic. It's uh, the epidemic of our generation. And what happens with these headlines is, and, and, and the sensationalism is, they get recycled right into a lawsuit. They become the basis of the lawsuit. This is paragraph one from a lawsuit filed recently in New York. It is well established that the nation is in the midst of an epidemic of addiction to opioid narcotics. So there it is, alleged as a fact, based a little more on, you know, based on little more than you know, sensationalistic news stories. Uh, now, let's take a look at some of the actual uh, uh, paragraphs where these things are played out. Um, let's see. Here is uh, South Carolina. Purdue's actions, Purdue is just one of the many, it's not as though this is just a Purdue problem, or at the very least, a substantial factor creating the public nuisance by deceiving prescribers and patients. Well, right there you, ha you have a problem. It's, is it all Purdue? There are dozens and dozens of companies that make opioids in one form or another. And there are 50 to 100 different types of opioids, which I'll show you in a second. And then they just allege that it's a substantial factor creating the nuisance. So, do they control it? How do these opioids get out there? How are they abused? How exactly is it caused by Purdue? The pleading doesn't explain it. They continue. The liability basis apparently is that but for this conduct, it would not have become so widespread. So it would have happened anyway? Well, you can't really tell. Would it have been averted or would it have been less severe? Now we've just heard of the basic allegations that you used to need at common law to support a nuisance claim. They are, of course, largely absent from these pleadings. Uh, let's take a look at another one from the city of New York. 
Uh, here, they go even further. Defendants' misrepresentations and actions created, caused, and contributed to a public nuisance. So apparently there's a public nuisance that's already out there that they uh, contributed to, including the rapid growth in demand for heroin, fentanyl, and other opiates sold through illegal street trade. So now they're using the tort to basically rope in sales of illegal fentanyl and heroin. I mean, heroin's been illegal for 100 years, and now they're laying this at the doorsteps of companies making uh, pharmaceuticals uh, lawfully. And when you get to the damages, the, the tort expands even further, and it, it becomes even, even more out of control. Uh, as a direct and foreseeable consequence of the manufacturing defendant's wrongful conduct, the city, that's New York City, has been required to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? Well, for what? For actual people who died, reimbursing them? No. Costs related to opioid overuse, addiction, misuse, healthcare, emergency response, addiction treatment, care management, law enforcement, criminal justice, and victimization costs. So the whole bill for the social pathology of addiction is going to be laid at the doorstep of these companies that manufacture lawful products through the vehicle of nuisance, among others. The next uh, damages, it goes even further in other states. For instance, South Carolina, they are bringing in uh, cases of hep C, children removed from their homes, Newborns addic born addicted to opioids, lost employee productivity due to opioid-related addiction. All of this in this giant bill that's going to be presented in this litigation. Now, keep in mind, the New York case, which wants hundreds of millions of dollars, as they conservatively put it, is just one of 200 cases. So, really, what they are bringing to the entire pharmaceutical industry, or anyone who ever touched an opioid is unlimited liability in the billions and billions of dollars which can't be quantified for every cost that any lawyer can dream up. Let's take a look at it. Is this really even an epidemic? Right? You know, an epidemic, the word epidemic implies that there is a single cause. The flu epidemic is caused by the flu virus, okay? Here, well, what exactly is the cause are we talking about? As I already mentioned, there are dozens and dozens of companies it's true they've picked out a few for the lawsuit, but if your damages are going to be all the results of all drug addiction and all opioid abuse in a given county or state, it's not going to be from just one drug. How many opioids are out there, do you think? Let's take a look. Here's a, a list of some of them. About 25 on this page, and these are just brand name opioids. Next page, these are fentanyl, hydromorphone-based opioids, morphine, oxycodone, roxanol, things like that. And then here's another list, and these are some more fentanyl, uh, morphine sulfate, uh, and methadone-based drugs. I mean, again, there are dozens and dozens of drugs. Which are the ones that are causing the problem? Is it all of them? How, how are they getting out there? Now, think about it for a minute. How do people take these drugs? How do they use them? You have to see a doctor. The doctor presumably knows you. He takes your history. He examines you and he makes an independent professional judgment as to whether or not to prescribe. So again, are, are we going to factor in these thousands and thousands and thousands of independent medical judgment pr uh, prescribing opioids when we decide whether or not opioids are a public nuisance? What about that? They, they really can't answer that. And that's why, in part, doctors are generally not parties in these suits, nor are pharmacies. Now, let's take a look at the, the epidemic result. Uh, there is a very large and growing number of deaths in this country by drug overdose. It's unfortunate and it is a public health problem that needs to be addressed seriously. No one is trying to underestimate the, the, the need for addressing that problem. But it's not caused entirely by an opioid epidemic. But some statistics. In 2016, by one count, there were 63,000 deaths by overdose of one form or another in the United States. 20,000 of those were from fentanyl. 15,000 were from heroin, which is illegal and doesn't come from any drug <laughs> company at all. 14,500 involved an opioid, but those opioids were often used off prescription illegally, and they were often used in combination with other drugs, contrary to the instructions. 
and they were often used uh, improperly. You know, they were ground up and, and, and used in a manner other than the, the way they should, were properly dispensed. And then the balance of the uh, uh, death by overdose were from other drugs unrelated to it. Now let's talk about fentanyl for a minute. 20,000 fentanyl deaths. Now fentanyl is an opioid, but fentanyl is a critical part of cancer treatment. People with excruciating cancer pain in the hospital are treated with fentanyl. It is not a typical outpatient drug. When fentanyl is used for outpatients, it's typically used in a patch on the skin that can't be readily uh, misused or, or converted into a, a, some criminal use. Where are these fentanyl deaths coming from? The bulk of them come from imported illegal fentanyl from China and Mexico. It is created outside the country and imported. Yet these fentanyl deaths are often also being laid through the vehicle of this tort and, and other similarly vague causes of action at, at the doorstep of, of the industry. Now, let's look at the users for a minute. Uh, the, the people who are actually unfortunately dying from uh, overdose. Uh, many of these people have a long history of drug abuse before using, using opioids. Many of them have mental illness. Many of them uh, take them with other drugs and they, they use them in a manner you're not supposed to. I mentioned before, crushing them and snorting them. Uh, but what is significant is an awful lot of them are not patients and they were never given them in, these drugs in the lawful uh, distribution scheme. For instance, there was a study done on OxyContin addicts and it was found that 78% per, uh, 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 of the addicts for OxyContin never had a legal prescription. 78% also had a period of drug abuse. So these are people that are illegally obtaining these prescriptions and illegally using them. So you have intervening criminal conduct that is being again laid at the doorstep of the, these manufacturers. But let's look at another group of users that, that's completely left out of all the press releases and the litigation. Uh, over 90 million people in a given year use an opioid in some form or another. It's used to create, to treat pain, serious pain. What kind of pain? Chronic pain sufferers, cancer, accident victims, failed surgeries, people with degenerated bone conditions. One half of all veterans from Afghanistan and Iran come back and complain of persistent pain. Some studies show between 12% of the population and as many as 50 million Americans suffer from continuing chronic pain in one, in one form or another. There is a $500 billion loss to the economy every year from lost work from pain. All right? These drugs are often the best answer to treat these people with these conditions. So if these drugs are a nuisance, how do you abate it? No one on the plaintiff's side is suggesting that we stop selling them. I mean, that's not even open. And no one is suggesting that these drugs don't do what they perform to do. They are talking about a very tiny percentage of people who, who become addicted, often through uh, their own misconduct. And even those that do use the, uh, the prescription properly, who on occasion become addicted to the drug, there are valid and, and, and there are recognized ways to treat people and if they're under a doctor's care and if they're in the, in the system properly, they can be treated and they, and they should be treated. Now, let's take a look at what happens when these go to court. These are very, these are in the, in the infant stages of litigation, but recently over a hundred of these have been uh, consolidated in the uh, United, U.S. District Court in Cleveland before Judge Dan Polster. And he was confronted with these hundreds of suits, a room full of lawyers, in a conference last January, and, and he offered some, some thoughts on these things. And I don't mean to single out the judge. I mean, he's given an impossible task. He's trying to do the best he can. But the very process and the fact that this is a litigation and not is trying to handle this problem through litigation just creates these, these, these intractable problems for the judge. And here he is. He says, in my humble opinion, Everyone shares some of the responsibility, and none of them has done enough to abate it. That includes the manufacturers, distributors, pharmacies, doctors, federal government, state government, local governments, hospitals, third-party payers. And he's right. They all have a hand in it. But they're not in this courtroom. They're not all getting sued. Right? The doctors aren't there. FDA isn't there. DEA isn't there. 
So he's doing it with only a few of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, stakeholders. And he's trying to handle this. And then what does he say next? As he goes on. People aren't interested in depositions, discovery, and trials. And that's true. They want to get this done. We've got to resolve this problem. But wait a minute. Depositions, discovery, and trials, that's how civil courts work. That's the process. So he seems to be saying that he doesn't want to follow the process, but, but that's it. Then he continues, people aren't interested in figuring out the answer to interesting legal questions like preemption and learned intermediary. Well, wait a minute. Preemption deals with pre-existing federal law, this complex system of, of regulations that these pharma companies and distributors spend billions of dollars a year to comply with to make sure that pure drugs are delivered and available. So we're not going to deal with the question of whether or not that should preempt common law nuisance. Learn an intermediary. Let's dispense with that too. You know what a learned intermediary is? It's a doctor. It's the pharmacist. So we're not going to address why these things are prescribed by the doctor and how they're prescribed. And then finally, unraveling complicated conspiracy theories. In other words, are you saying so we're not going to sit back and try and see whether there really is an epidemic and really how it was caused or we're just going to sort of assume that it's there uh, and that it's from some unified you know, source, you know, orchestrated by drug companies. It's, it's just not realistic to use this process to address this problem. And then finally, he talks about resolutions, potential resolutions. Is, but the potential, the resolution I'm talking about is really, what I'm interested in doing is not just moving money around. Now, just stop for a minute. <laughs> not just moving money around. There are billions and billions of dollars, so I don't know what he means by that. But at the end of the day, that's why these cases are filed, and that's what these plaintiffs are looking for, whether the judge is interested in looking at it or not. What we've got to do here is dramatically reduce the number of pills that are made out there and make sure that the pills that are out there are being used properly. Well, yeah, and, but who makes sure pills are being used doc properly? Doctors, pharmacists. How about uh, making sure that there's, that there's not too many pills out there? Well, you know, right now, DEA... Uh, has the power to limit the amount of these pills that are manufactured and sold, and in fact does set limits. Uh, and then finally, but of course DEA isn't there. And finally, the, the problem with the <laughs> limitation of pills is you're assuming it's a good thing. If you look at the literature now, if you just Google it, it's not that hard, you will find serious pain doctors and pain clinics, they will tell you opioids are underprescribed, that patients are not getting them when they should be getting them. And that doctors are reluctant to prescribe them for any number of reasons, and among which are they're afraid of ending up on, on the DEA's screen. Doctors have, in fact, been arrested in at least one case in New York, and they've gotten into litigation trouble for supposedly overprescribing. The pharma companies make products used to help seriously ill people. They are used by many millions of people, as many as 90 million in a given a year. Most of these prescriptions are written by doctors that genuinely care about their patients, that know about their that know their patients' history, and that know what the law is and do their job properly. True, some are misused and diverted. In a country of over 300 million people, with millions and millions of sick people, the number that can be diverted can be quite large. But to assume from that 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 is the, uh, done by design by these companies is just not supported. In any case, the way you deal with it is not by bringing a public nuisance claim. The nuisance claim shifts responsibility for intervening criminal conduct and inadequate safeguards to the, the manufacturers and the distributors really without much justification. Now, when I say that, look at what you have to do to manufacture a drug. The entire manufacturing process is regulated. Manufacturers cannot sell without FDA approval. All these so-called misrepresentations that supposedly were made, they're made to the FDA when these companies submit applications and submit data supporting the pill, and the FDA reviews it. And there is a process and a machinery that deals with that, all right? Manufacturers cannot sell without approval. Generic makers of these drugs they cannot launch a generic without FDA approval. You cannot put a label on a drug that isn't reviewed by the FDA and without FDA approval. You can't change your label without FDA approval. 
Opioids can only be sold through a licensed distribution system, through distributors, all of which have a license either at the federal level or state level, from the national distributor down to the, the corner pharmacy. Every single one of those people is, is licensed. Right, and, and the DEA is watching them. <laughs> the federal regulations require the distributors in particular to make detailed filings of their sales to the DEA. They are required, if they see anything that looks unusual or improbable or improper, to file a report alerting the DEA. And they do file them, and they file dozens of them. And they're there for the DEA to review. The, these, these so the, the notion that these companies don't do anything and don't keep track of it is just wrong. Finally, again, in terms of the nuisance idea, as was pointed out earlier, these nuisance claims especially in this setting, they undermine the rule of law. They impose or threaten to impose a crushing liability without any ascertainable standards of conduct and really with, without any way of even gauging the, the uh, scope or the value of the harm that is claimed. They are a way for municipalities to tax absent defendants and you think about this for a minute. There are no doctors generally in these suits, right? And there are no pharmacies in these suits. And well, why is that? Well, maybe one reason is because when Allegheny County brings a lawsuit, they don't want to sue their own taxpayers and they don't want to sue their own voters. And how, how about this? When Allegheny County or New York State brings a lawsuit, Sometimes you can remove it to federal court, but oftentimes you can't. So that means the nuisance claim is ultimately going to be decided, whether it stays or goes, by a judge, often elected by the same people that elected the attorney, uh, the state's attorney that is bringing the claim. Is that really a just way to make social policy? What, what do uh, plaintiff's lawyers say about this? Recently you can see that there's an article where... Uh, uh, famous uh, Mr. Richard Scrubs is, is talking about the tobacco litigation, compelling this tobacco litigation. And he thinks these, <laughs> these new forms of action and like nuisance are just great because they avoid, as he says, the need to identify a particular product and a particular defendant and tie it to a particular harm. A lawyer in New York just a couple of weeks back published an article explaining why she was bringing and using the vehicle of uh, uh, municipal claims and claims like nuisance. Because she explained, well, we found that when we tried to bring these claims, the plaintiffs were very unsympathetic because they were drug addicts and often had criminal records, so jurors were reluctant to sympathize with them. We had to find a solution for that. So that's why, why, why we're here. You know, the, the cases are resolved by a litigation process that itself really can't, it isn't designed to deal with social problems like this. The use of nuisance claims, in short, for these cases, it needs to be reined in. They are not the right way to deal with a complex problem like the, the opioid problem is today. It's not the right machinery. There's no standard. And as, as I've just explained, half the people that you need to resolve the problem aren't even going to be in the room. Thank you. Yes, Cliff. Oh, that's it. Could you? Oh, just sit. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, we're uh, happy to take any questions that anybody has. If you've been watching uh, with the screen maximized, minimize it back down to the right of the screen. There's a, a template for either Q&A or former videos. Click on Q&A and you can type in a question that uh, comes to me and I'd be happy to forward it ahead to the, to the speakers. Um, one question for you, Rick. I've, I've read that there are some right-leaning and libertarian-leaning uh, commentators that have expressed a preference for these kinds of lawsuits over regulation because they don't trust the government to, to do the right thing. What is your response to, to those who believe that? Well, I think that if we rely upon 12 people in a jury box uh, and one judge to, to start, decide these sorts of issues, and think that in any way their decision is somehow going to solve the scope of the problem that we have, we're deceiving ourselves. Uh, those situations are made to resolve individual concerns and individual problems, not gigantic cosmic 
or social issues. Uh, the social issue question is a matter for Congress, for our legislatures, uh, the people that are there to make sure that the standards are fair and consensus and majority uh, held by our people. Uh, and if we start deciding our issues and our democracy on the basis of lawsuits, uh, we're basically taking one-third of our Constitution's responsible branches and uh, jettisoning the other two, which were really designed to effectuate democracy. Do you want to add something to that, Neil? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the judicial process is, is a limited process. Uh, the, the judge cannot do what the legislature can do if you just think in terms of, of how he goes about doing things. Legislatures can appoint committees, they can do studies, they can review evidence, they can take time, they can hear from all the constituencies. Uh, a panel can, can issue subpoenas and bring in everybody. They have control over the FDA to some extent. Also, what it ignores, for instance, in the, uh, the critique ignores, and the reality is, is there is a regulatory system in place. It is there, and these people, the, the companies have relied on it, complied with it, and it is working to some extent, and the answer, I think, is to fix the existing system, not to lay it off in court. And finally, the courts are there really to resolve disputes between a plaintiff and a defendant. It's an adversary system. So when a jury is asked to make a finding or a judge is asked to decide a case, they don't say to the judge or the jury, please find the most you know, socially efficient way to resolve this problem for the benefit of all. It's... Does the plaintiff get the money, or does, I mean, does the plaintiff get the money, or doesn't he? Does the defendant have to pay the money or not? And all they see is the very narrow record of evidence that attorneys have actually decided to put before them. So they're not even going to see the whole picture. So I, I don't think it's realistic. One thing, though, here is that's getting ignored is that to the extent someone's injured because of a drug that's not properly manufactured, or the warnings are inadequate, or their doctor didn't give them the right information. We have an existing body of jurisprudence. There's product liability law and malpractice law. It's 100 years old. There are hundreds of skilled practitioners in the area who can bring redress for the individual. So to the extent it's an individual claim, the court system's there and it will work. To the extent, though, we're trying to solve what to do about the so-called opioid epidemic, I'm sorry, but that's not one for the court. Question from an online viewer. Should foreign sovereign nations and their national oil companies be required parties in climate change litigation? <laughs> uh, we, we, can talk about, we can talk about that issue. I'm not so sure that domestic uh, uh, oil companies uh, should be parties or that these litigations should even exist at all under the circumstances. Uh, we're deluding ourselves. If, if we think that we can somehow finger a few people or a few gargantuan people and, and assign a cosmic problem to their actions alone. Global warming is a societal problem through and through. It is a situation that we have uh, nurtured ever since we lit our first fire and probably uh, to some extent will be fed until such time as the last fire goes out. Uh, it's, a, it's not that I disagree with the, with the fact that global warming is a bad thing. I do believe it is a existing thing. I do believe it is something that is a problem, but I don't necessarily think that you can really seriously blame it on a few companies around the globe or even hundreds of companies around the globe. This is a global problem that is an earth-wide issue. And so far, our societies, or all the societies on earth, have proven inadequate to even address this issue reliably, scientifically, and in a way that can be reasonably and civilly discussed. Neil, the... Um arguments that the manufacturers have made where they've been able to make them in, in some of the answers to the complaints and, and motions to dismiss have raised the preemption issue that anything that results from these state and 
civil city lawsuits are going to create labeling and advertising and other requirements that FDA is already regulating and might create different ones. Uh, are, are, are you surprised that rather than burnish that argument, which I think is very good for the FDA and, and, and good for regulation in general, the DOJ is going to be issuing uh, statements that are supportive of the, the lawsuits that have been brought rather than call them into question. Are you surprised by that? Yeah, I, I'm surprised. Well, <laughs> uh, on an intellectual level and a policy level, I'm surprised and, and disappointed that the uh, Justice Department is weighing in on, on uh, in favor of using these lawsuits as a mechanism to solve the problem. On the other hand, am I surprised? I'm afraid, unfortunately, it's been going around, and this has been going on for some time. It isn't the first time it's happened. And it goes back to uh, something I, I alluded to, which is you can uh, go in and say, we have a very serious social problem. We need to raise taxes and raise money to deal with it. <laughs> Who wants to do that? You, you, have an, you have an ambitious person who wants to uh, go to the lead in this problem, so they'll bring some lawsuits. It, it, it's unfortunately, it is an easy answer. Uh, I don't think it's good policy, and uh, it is disappointing that the Justice Department has elected to go this way. But uh, unfortunately, and it's, uh, really, let's not single out the Justice Department. The New York State Attorney General uh, is doing an investigation right now with 42 states. Uh, many of these uh, actions have been filed by, by state attorneys. So, yeah, it's, it's disappointing they choose to proceed this way, but uh, it is not surprising. Rick, what was it about the case in California that you think was different from the one in Rhode Island and Illinois and other places that made it successful for the plaintiffs in that instance and, and resulted in the damages that it did in the, in the lead paint cases? I think what uh, happened in California was that, in fact, the California Supreme Court, when it had the chance to, or the lower courts, when they had the chance to follow what California law said, which said there must be standards to govern this situation. And without reliable standards, there can be no liability for public nuisance. They, the law was on the books in California. Uh, I one of the law review articles I, I, I've written deals specifically with that issue. There was no doubt that uh, California law precluded this sort of amalgamation of litigation to deal with an alleged social problem. Uh, but the courts and ultimately the California Supreme Court decided not even to weigh in when its own uh, cases had been ignored by the lower courts. It was a, uh, a, a disappointing oversight, perhaps, or it could have been a deliberate choice that the case did not, for whatever reason, uh, invoke their attention. But I can tell you, the laws are in the books and so long as the California courts keep going that way, they're going to find sooner or later that the law is going to be staring them right back out of the books and saying, you changed me, or we're going to have a long discussion in front of the California Supreme Court. Neil, you talked about the multi-district litigation that's uh, going on by the that brought all of the cities and, and counties' lawsuits together, but there are still a good number of state lawsuits that are out there that were filed in state court that cannot be removed to federal court because it's the sovereign that, that ended up bringing them. What do you think is going to happen in those cases if there's an effort to try to settle the, the MDL case? Well, uh, I assume that they'll go a lot like uh, prior mass litigation. I mean, they're, they're in the, we have a history of these things. There was drug pricing litigation that went on for many years. And uh, the things just settle in time one by one. Uh, on the other hand, let's, let's not be, be premature. I mean, um, these cases, as I tr tried to indicate, have serious legal, legal issues. So my, my own hope here is that the defendants start, start winning some of these. And, you know, there, there is grounds for some hope. Some of these nuisance claims have been thrown out on the grounds that they're not, on very literal grounds that they're not related to real property. 
Uh, unfortunately, many judges are reluctant to en enter decisions early on when, when they're brought by the sovereign. But uh, I, I'm optimistic that you know the defendants will uh, proceed aggressively and uh, try and get good results early. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a, a long and drawn out process. Uh, defendants are also incentivized to settle these things for any number of reasons, completely divorced from the merits, and we, we often see that happening. So it's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but uh, regardless of what goes on in the multi-district case, uh, I think we may see these other cases proceed along the wrong tracks for, you know, certainly a couple of more years. If, if those cases do end up settling, obviously there's no test of, of the legal theories whatsoever, but Rick, do you think that, that the success that the plaintiff's lawyers and the state officials might have in the opioid context is going to have a, a ripple effect on, on the desire of, of those types of, of public officials to bring more lawsuits under the rubric of climate change? Well, I once wrote an article that describes these situations pretty well. It was called uh, Armageddon Through Aggregation. And what ends up happening is that the bigger the stack of injustice gets, the more dangerous it is. And uh, when we deal with cases in an aggregated format, we tend to dignify many times those cases that aren't uh, appropriate for inclusion, and they tend to pile on. And when that happens, uh, people are misled as to the uh, importance of dealing with cases that really are injustices, because we make microcosms out of uh, these things, and we make macrocosms out of these things in reverse. Uh, the distortion of per perspective is inherent in mass tort litigation. And cases that are not uh, as meritorious as one thinks they might should be suddenly become incredibly important because they're part of a network of claims that is an overwhelming number of aggregated claims. Uh, do I know what the future of this is? Uh, I thought that class action reform was going to bring this to a significant end. And yes, we have had major improvements in class action abuse and avoiding these situations. What we don't have, we now have been collecting people without even naming a class representative and naming them all in one lawsuit and then somehow hoping that some single remedy is going to satisfy everyone. It's justice by shortcut. It's not justice. It's not what people are entitled to. That's not truly due process. If your due process is determined by the 80,000 other people in a case when you've never been represented truly at all with a day in court, it may be useful to you if you happen to be a winner, but if you're a loser, it doesn't help. And if you're a defendant, the justice is distorted, the penalties are distorted if you lose, and the victories are distorted if you win. So we need to get back to the point where we have plaintiff and defendant, judge and jury, and make those sorts of decisions. And the more of those decisions that we try and deal with, the greater impact and reliability it's going to have. I like the idea of test plaintiffs in mass tort cases. Let's have a set of people that are going to be looked at, selected by everyone according to his criteria approved by the judge, and have a series of those to determine reliability. But we're not even thinking of that. That didn't even happen in California because no single homeowner was really a true plaintiff whose rights were decided in the cases. It's a, uh, a misleading uh, misjudgment, and it's something that needs to be changed. I don't care whether it's changed by statute, by uh, the courts themselves, but it, they need to resolve this issue. The uh, public nuisance theory was attempted back 10 years ago or so more uh, against the firearms industry to not very much success. Do you see that litigation coming back around again uh, in, in the near future, given the current climate? Well, if you, uh, if you think about it, uh, if you stand in one place long enough, sooner or later you're going to get hit by the same car uh, if it doesn't kill you first. Uh, but the, 
the law is circular. And uh, there are people who look for opportunities. And when one door is closed, they look for another door that's opened. Uh, I, I'm not saying and I'm not hoping that there'll be further mass tort litigation over guns. But the issue is now very highly elevated in our society. And it's highly emotional. And those are key signs that there is some sort of movement going on and I'm not surprised that lawyers would be a part of that movement. Thoughts on that, Neil? Yeah, it's interesting. In New York, uh, when the Intermediate Appellate Court uh, dismissed some of these the gun nuisance claims some years back, and indeed I, I think that particular precedent is it's going to be extremely valuable in the uh, nuisance claims in, in these drug cases in New York. And we were very fortunate because in New York we, we do have a good solid court system and we do have judges who will apply the law and the law is pretty good and, and it should come out properly. So I, I think that right now, you, you know, uh, it, it looks pretty good. I don't expect it to come back, but you know, um, 10 years, 15 years is a long time. And uh, I have to agree with my colleague here that unfortunately a thin claim can become a strong claim if the damage and the harm that's being litigated is big and significant enough. Um, you know, courts in New York have resisted that and stuck to the law up till now, uh, and I'm optimistic they will continue to do so, though. Final question from an online viewer. How much will all this litigation cost private businesses in the U.S., and can they really actually afford it? <laughs> you speak for your clients, <laughs> and then I'll speak. Well, th this is not really a, a client-specific uh, answer by, by any stretch. Uh, it's really impossible to, I, I couldn't put a number on it, I, I just don't have the figures. Uh, the reality is is that large companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars on, on litigation, uh, depending on what the company is and what business they're in. Uh, they're going to have to spend a lot of money, and it really is an, it is an unfortunate you know, drag on the business, it is an expense. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be significant, I, I can't give you a number. No, I, I can't give you a number either, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry I smiled when I heard the question because it's not a, a laughing matter. Uh, the burden on America's businesses by virtue of litigation that is, shall we say, I'd say to be generous, experimental, uh, also perhaps litigation that is adventurous, uh, ambitious, uh, it is the job of our colleagues on the plaintiff's side to find redress when redress is deserving, and they are the ones that make those decisions, uh, and we are the ones that have to analyze them and respond to them in a rational way. Um, I see no reason to think that the fascination with mass torts has gone away despite class action reform. It's just arisen in a different vehicle. The new vehicle is public nuisance litigation because it has no rules. It's all common law. And so the court, being a common law court, can decide what the rules should be. Maybe bound by the rules of evidence to some degree, maybe bound by procedural rules, but in general to create substantive law, if it's a problem and an injustice is present, there's an opening for common law courts, whether that's right or wrong. It is a tremendous vehicle that's susceptible to abuse in our society. There definitely seems to be a, a propelling desire to do something about something these days, and, and public nuisance has become like I said in the, in the introduction, sort of the default mechanism for that. We'll wrap up. I want to thank you both for speaking with us today and uh, for your questions and your answers, uh, those of you online. And uh, we will uh, keep up on this issue as, as things go forward. Rick, Neil, thank you. Thank, thank you, Glenn.